morning, everybody. Great work on the exam, guys. We'll talk about VEO. You've heard a little bit about that already this morning in Pete's talk. You know, this goes back a long way, all the way back into the, uh, um, into the 1940s. A guy named Bennett first described what he called the uh, so-called osteochondritis of the professional pitcher's elbow. And, and if you read, the, read his article, he talks about semi-detached bodies by the medial epicondyle, loose bodies in the olecranon fossa, and stated at that time that removal um, does away with all symptoms. What he's describing there is valgus extension overload and chronic UCL insufficiency uh, as we know it today. So described all the way back in 1941. Uh, Graham King in 1969 sort of expanded this a little bit and he called this the medial stress syndrome of the elbow. He described this in 50 professional baseball players that he had taken care of and he proposed that valgus or tension causes medial side problems and compression leads to pathology seen on the lateral side of the elbow. And this was published in 1969 in clinical orthopedics or later research. So today what we understand is valgus extension overload is a, a little syndrome of posterior medial pain. Typically it follow through the pitching motion. It's reproduced on exam by forced extension and valgus. You just saw a good demonstration of that. And it may be related to UCL insufficiency and you'll see some evidence of that uh, as we go on. Um, path pathologically we see synovitis. We see chondromalacia, we can see loose bodies, and we can see osteophyte formation in long-standing disease. And this is what this looks like on a CT scan. You can see the force coming in from the lateral side. This was explained nicely earlier today um, uh, in Dr. Chalmers' talk. Um, you can see where the compression would be on the lateral side, and um, you'd see tension then on the medial side as this force crosses across the joint. This is the area typically that we see these, uh, these little osteophytes, uh, valgus extension uh, overload osteophytes in the posterior medial aspect uh, of the tip of the electron. This is an actual CT scan from uh, one of our uh, starting pitchers. Um, you can see the lateral side disease here uh, as well. Um, this is a pretty advanced uh, um, uh, example. Uh, and again, you can see the, uh, the posterior medial osteophyte uh, you see some spurring in the front. You actually see a loose body uh, uh, in this example. On MRI, this is typically what you see in the back of the elbow. You can see synovitis. You can see loose bodies. You can see some spur formation. Uh, and in the front, uh, in more advanced disease, such as this case, you can also see a little spurring at the tip of the, uh, uh, of the coronoid process. So I mentioned earlier this is probably related to UCL insufficiency, and Dave Alchek has done some nice work on this in, the, uh, in a cadaveric model and demonstrated there's increased contact pressure that shifted medially and decreased contact area in UCL insufficient specimens. And he concluded that valgus laxity throughout the throwing motion may lead to chondromalacia in the posterior medial compartment uh, of the thrower's elbow. So how do we treat this? Well, Initially, uh, we use uh, a short period of rest, anti-inflammatories. Uh, this is a great, um, a great problem to treat with corticosteroid injection, uh, barring any mechanical or locking type symptoms. Uh, if this fails, we go on to arthroscopic debridement uh, with osteophyte and loose body removal. That may be uh, necessary. In the face of chronic disease and chronic UCL insufficiency, loose bodies, osteophytes often return after a few seasons. Um, and, you know, many of our veteran athletes um, um, will have had several scopes during their career if they've not had uh, a UCL reconstruction. Uh, for my surgical colleagues in the room, this is all quite familiar. Um, <clears throat> I do scopes in the lateral position, uh, just basic uh, arthroscopy principles. I won't belabor that. There's a multitude of different portal sites that allow us access uh, uh, to the elbow uh, uh, when, we're, uh, when we're in the operating room. And our posterior compartment debridement basically consists of removal of loose bodies, um, um, a, a, a synovectomy, uh, an excision of the olecranon tip spur. So this is what this looks like. Uh, the arthroscope is in the posterior lateral uh, uh, portal, the right elbow uh, of a pitcher. And what we see here um, on the bottom is the olecranon tip, and you can see that, uh, that little spur, very similar to what you saw on the, uh, on the MRI scan. And as the elbow comes into extension, uh, you can see where that might impinge uh, up on the back of the, uh, uh, the fossa and the distal humerus uh, relating to symptoms. Um, and um, there's also some synovitis associated with this. Uh, so we'll come in, there's a very uh, variety of instruments we can use. Sometimes you use just a little shaver, uh, sometimes a burr if you're going to do a little bit more work. Uh, and the goal here is to simply remove all the, uh, the chondromalacia, the loose fragments, the osteophytes, uh, and the synovium so there's no longer any impingement uh, in the back of the elbow 
uh, as, this is as this elbow extends uh, in the late uh, phases of the throwing motion. And this is what it looks like after it's been taken out, um, a little more uh, freedom here, um, no more spur. Uh, synovium has been taken out as well, um, and, uh, and uh, that's, that's really all there is to that. Um, I talked about just taking off the spur. This has been uh, shown in the laboratory to be very important. Kamineni did some very nice work, uh, published in the uh, Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery back in 2004, where he measured uh, strain across the ulnar collateral ligament uh, in the face of um, a progressively more aggressive resection of the tip of the olecranon, and determined that resection should only include the native bone as you as you remove, or should not include the, uh, the native bone. You can only remove the spur only as you start to take more and more of the back of the elbow away, you're, you're um, eliminating uh, important bony stability, uh, increasing strain on the ligament, uh, and I'm sure most of, uh, most of my veteran colleagues here in the room uh, have seen ulnar collateral ligament sprains as a result of too aggressive uh, removal uh, of spurs in the back of the elbow, and those have been published. The outcome of this uh, surgery has been, uh, been published uh, by Dr. Andrews, 14% uh, reoperation uh, rate, and uh, they noted back in the day uh, better results in the face of UCL reconstruction, again, pointing to the fact that most of these athletes probably have some insufficiency uh, in their ulnar collateral ligament. In, the, in, the, in our adolescent players, uh, one published study uh, returned a play rate of 85%, and again, uh, the ulnar collateral ligament comes into play, noting that ulnar collateral ligament insufficiency, uh, um, when noted, uh, was associated with less optimal outcomes. Moving on to some of the more bony uh, problems we see uh, in the back of the olecranon, we described stress injury of the proximal ulna about 17 years ago. Um, uh, this is uh, relatively uncommon, uh, and it's tensile failure of the proximal medial ulnar trabecular bone uh, without bicortical fracture, and this is seen on MRI scan. Uh, we differentiate this from an MCL sprain um, based on their physical exam. They have pain and tenderness of the olecranon, proximal and dorsal to the ulnar collateral ligament. It's that posterior medial corner, very similar to where they're having symptoms with uh, valgus extension overload. Uh, the MRI is very helpful, and um, we, we see that the ligament is intact in these situations where the bone uh, is starting to show stress fracture. Uh, and I think what's going on here is that UCL laxity allows for shear across the posterior medial joint that leads to valgus extension overload. And in the face of an intact ligament, there's constant stress on the ulna that can lead to trabecular failure. And this is treated with non-operative uh, treatment if there's no fracture line, which is typical um, in these true stress fractures. Um, you know, we consider a bone growth stimulator and return to throws based upon clinical response. The majority return to play by about three months. Uh, we're not typically doing repeat MRIs, um, but if you've got somebody who's slow to respond, uh, it, may be, uh, it may be indicated. Um, <clears throat> more commonly, um, we see uh, olecranon apophyseal fractures, and this is characterized by immediate severe posterior pain during the follow-through of a throw. Uh, the characteristic x-rays, as you see here, Dr. Potter discussed this a little bit yesterday. Um, uh, there's a classification scheme for olecranon stress fractures that you can look up, and again, uh, we see the, uh, the association with ulnar collateral ligament um, um, uh, problems um, uh, in the face of, of olecranon fractures here. Uh, our fixation options for true bicortical fracture uh, of the olecranon include cannulated screws, uh, a single home run screw, if, if technically you can do it, that's a nice way to do it. Tension bands uh, tend to stay away from wire suture. If you're going to use a tension band, it's probably better. Plates and screws, um, we've only done that a couple of times, typically in revision situations with non-unions. Um, that's usually not a uh, first line of treatment. We've all seen these, we've all done these as surgeons who take care of baseball players. This is not a slam dunk operation. Um, this is something you need to take seriously. Uh, we need to adhere to, uh, to our solid principles. If you look at this uh, report um, uh, on Dr. Andrews' patients published in 2013, and 56% of the athletes underwent 13 more surgeries. It's a pretty amazing number. A lot of repeat surgery. 33% um, for hardware removal, two infections, um, and these are, these are surgeries done uh, by one of the premier surgeons in the world. Uh, so this is something that needs to be taken very seriously um, and not just, you no, know, we just throw a screw across this and be done with it. You really have to pay attention to this. Um, outcomes from this have been published recently. Uh, Dr. Erickson uh, and Dr. Romeo, uh, Chris is on this paper as well. In fact, we got half the staff on this paper. Dr. Chalmers is there also. John D'Angelo, everybody's here. Kevin's here too. Um, there's interesting, if you look at the return to play rates, about 67%. Um, 
you know, which, uh, you know, it's, it, it's not a real high number, um, but it's interesting because it's not different from the natural attrition am among matched controls. In other words, um, <clears throat> athletes who were not injured did not necessarily have uh, a surgical problem. Um, um, and didn't, uh, uh, um, or, um, the um, athletes that had the surgery um, didn't have any, any greater loss of uh, a return to play than, the, than those match control athletes. So, and they also noted no decline in performance metrics was seen among players who were able to return to play. So finally, um, you know, it's important, posterior medial pain in the thoracic elbow is often arises from, from joint or osseous structures. You know, a lot of us have seen athletes that are referred to us with a diagnosis of triceps tendonitis. I've never seen triceps tendonitis in a throwing athlete. It just doesn't, doesn't seem to happen very often. So uh, posterior pain is almost always related to osseous structures or something going on in the joint. I think non-mechanical symptoms of valgus extension overload and posterior pain uh, can be treated non-operably and managed throughout a season. These are the athletes that will go ahead and, uh, uh, and uh, pr uh, perform a corticosteroid injection. If they have mechanical symptoms, locking and things, I think you're obligated to proceed probably more quickly with an arthroscopic procedure uh, to remove those loose bodies and take care of the osteophytes. If you do undergo a, a, a surgical procedure, we want to make sure we limit our bone resection simply to the osteophyte and stay away from the native bone. And always keep in the back of your mind that UCL insufficiency is probably in there somewhere uh, in this equation, and that we need to consider that and may need uh, uh, further treatment from that standpoint as well. And finally, then, aggressive treatment for, uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, olecranon fractures is, is very important. We need to um, um, count on solid fixation uh, and, and stick with our uh, uh, very solid uh, AO fixation principles. Thank you very much.